welcome to the Hey Taylor podcast, where ambition is a gift, not a burden, where what you desire for your life is 100% possible, and where happiness and success can coexist beautifully. In this podcast, I'm bringing you casual conversations on deep alignment, self-mastery, and high performance. Each week, my guests and I will guide you to go big with your dreams and reconnect you to your infinite potential, because I believe you deserve wild happiness and success in every area of your life. On this podcast, we don't shy away from the deep topics and tough love because we know that personal development isn't about going through life. It's about growing through life. And I'm your host, Taylor Thompson. I'm a high-performance strategist, business mentor, multi-passionate serial entrepreneur, soon-to-be author, and your breakthrough personal development bestie. Pull up your note-taking app and let's unlock your next level of happiness and success. Your highest potential is waiting. human design, astrology, you might be thinking, what the heck are some of these posts and accounts that are going viral on Instagram talking about all of these things? Or if you're not super new to personality tests and archetypes, then you probably can't get enough of them. Today, we are talking about self-mastery and really the first step to self-mastery, which is ultimately self-discovery. And one of my favorite ways to discover yourself is through personality tests and archetype assessments. So like I said, the first step to self-mastery really is self-discovery. I'm going to break down what the steps to self-mastery really are. There's there's six-ish steps in the process and define those right off the bat. First off, step one is self-discovery. And this is really the process of acquiring insight to one's own character and personality. So it's really just about discovering information about yourself. And that's really what this episode is going to be. Step two is self-awareness. And so this is conscious knowledge of one's character, feelings, motives, and desires. Next is self-acceptance, and that's an individual's acceptance of all of their attributes, positive or negative, and then their self-development, and that's the process of consciously improving oneself in various aspects of life. This is a lot like personal development. Step number five is self-esteem, and that's the confidence in one's own worth or abilities. This is semi-interchangeable with self-respect. And then step six is self-mastery. And that's the commitment to never-ending improvement and mastering oneself. Those six steps, step one, self-discovery. Step two, self-awareness. Step three, self-acceptance. Step four, self-development. Step five, self-esteem. And step six, self-mastery. Wow, that was a lot of S's (laughs) between the steps and selves. Ultimately, what they are is they're really about increasing your understanding of you, your relationship with yourself, your contribution to other relationships, your contribution to the world, how you view the world, who you are, your tendencies, your habits, your needs, your values, your personality, your strengths, your opportunities for growth, and all those types of things. And ultimately, achieving these steps in order is very, very important. So if you listen to episode one, I talked a lot about my story and I I was obsessed with personal development basically since I was about 17 or 18 years old, obsessed. And personal development really falls under that step four of self-development. And none of the personal development work I was doing was actually sticking, <laughs> right? I knew all of the things but I wasn't integrating them for a lot of reasons. One of them being I didn't go through self-discovery or self-awareness process. I had no idea who I was and therefore I couldn't accept myself for who I was. So trying to develop myself didn't work because ultimately what I was doing was I was developing a version of myself that wasn't truly who I was. It was who other people wanted me to be. So completing these steps, really going through these steps in order is really, really, really important. So if you're listening to this and you have been doing personal development work for years or decades, whatever it is, if you've been doing it and it's not fully been working, 
it might be because you need to go back to step one to this self-discovery. And this is what this entire episode is going to be. So what's really the purpose of this? I want to give you a few reasons why self-mastery work is so important. When you know who you are, you'll feel more fulfilled, connected, and integrated in life, right? You're going to feel less alone, less lost, because when we don't know ourselves, we can become easily frustrated with our shortcomings, with our failures, with our results. When we do know ourselves, we can create a more tailored, customized plan for how we best work, how we best achieve, and how we handle the good things and the bad things. Reason number two is it helps you come home to who you are and not who others want you to be. When you don't know who you are, it's so easy for the outside world to shape who you are. And if you listen to episode one, I talked about this when I was talking about my story. So much of the success and happiness that I was chasing was what other people, like, and when I say other people, really society, what other people and society were influencing me to want and do. It was lots of shoulds. I was like, oh, I should be doing this. Or, oh, this is just what you do. Because I didn't, I didn't know who I was. At that point, I hadn't done self-discovery. I actually skipped steps. <laughs> I was working on self-development. I was working on personal development, but I didn't really know myself. So none of it stuck and I hadn't accepted who I was, right? So it was like I skipped steps. So anytime I would write down goals, they weren't really what I wanted. They were influenced from other people around me. Also, I was like so wrapped up in scaling and having big achievements without even knowing why I was pursuing them. And ultimately it was because other people wanted me to. Self-mastery, the pursuit and the process of self-mastery helps you come home to who you are and shed the layers of conditioning of who other people want you to be. Reason number three that self-mastery work is so important is because it helps you find deeper alignment and clarity. So integrating you know, self-discovery and self-awareness into the alignment journey has truly made all the difference for my clients and students and for myself. Because self-awareness is really about increasing the understanding of you, who you are, your tendencies, you know, like I said, it's everything about you. So general reflection on alignment is good and it can help, but what about our potential blind spots, right? We don't know what those are unless we've done the self-discovery work and become self-aware. Self-discovery really helps us see these blind spots as well as it helps us be proactive and actually crafting highly intentional integration plans based on your strengths and desires while moving away from your weaknesses, while helping you overcome obstacles in a unique way, while befriending your fears and really helping you look out for improvement opportunities and opportunities for growth. So a couple examples of this and how powerful it is to help you get deeper into alignment. So example number one, let's use marriage, okay? Let's say that your value, again, if you listen to episode one, then you have a understanding of kind of the hierarchy of alignment that I talked about and why it's important to lead values first. So let's say marriage is your pillar and connection is your value. So if you are if you are a projector in human design, you know that you best recharge for others when you yourself are recharged. So this may look like making sure your cup is full so that you can connect more deeply with your partner. This is so, so important. Recharging is so important for projectors in human design. So if your goal and your value is a deeper connection with your spouse or any relationship you're in and you're a projector, then you know that you are going to be your best for your partner when your cup is full. So prioritizing that first, that just helps you get into deeper alignment. Example number two, let's use business as an example. And let's say your value is autonomy. If you are in a neogram two, the helper, then you may say yes to discounts, yes to clients, projects, collaborations, and more that give you less autonomy. Understanding what your natural tendencies might be as an Enneagram 2, which a lot of times is saying yes to things before 
really evaluating if it's a yes. By doing that self-discovery work, understanding that about yourself, then you can start to shift and really use autonomy as your guiding light values first and know that you tend to say yes a lot. And in just being aware of that and developing that, growing that, becoming better about saying yes only to the things that help lead you closer to autonomy. So whether or not alignment comes naturally to you, self-discovery is a really incredible tool that can help us shortcut alignment. And I'll go to more examples um, in this episode as well. So we can really use self-discovery as a lens to reflect on every piece of our life, which then gets us into deeper alignment, which is so special. Reason number four that self-mastery work is so important is that it helps you shortcut your success. I know I was just talking about alignment. Now it's going to shift to success. Knowing how you best work, operate, and move throughout the world gives you an advantage and really helps you move quicker because you can tailor and customize every single thing you do through the lens of your unique shines and shadows. You get to look at what your potential blind spots might be, and you get to plan for them ahead of time versus pushing through them and not knowing what is keeping you stuck, not knowing what is slowing you down. And also you can make better decisions, right? Every decision you make or don't make has an underlying reason to it, whether you're consciously aware of it or not. So when you have more insight into how you make decisions, you can make better decisions, right? Because you know where they're coming from. Reason number five that self-mastery work is so incredibly important is it helps you relate to others on a new level because you get to understand how you best communicate and what strengths you bring to the table, as well as what shadows you may have. I know this is huge, especially if you are trying to make new friends. It can be really, really uncomfortable to do the self-discovery work, but if you're having difficulty making new friends, a lot of times I see one of two things. One, you're in such deep alignment and you know yourself so well that you're just connecting with the wrong people. When I say wrong people, just a wrong fit. And you know, the other side of the spectrum where I see this is people are not self-aware as much. They haven't done that self-discovery work. They don't know who they are. And so they don't really have an idea of some of the shadows that they might be bringing to a potential new relationship. And so it's easy to place blame externally, whereas so much can come from internal. So when you do that self-discovery work, it's like, oh, I realize that maybe I share too much. <laughs> when I meet somebody the first time, I'm talking about, you know, death or um, this weird fungus that I have on my toe or <laughs> something like that, you know? And so when we're not self-aware, we might not know that we're maybe coming on too strong or maybe not coming on strong enough. You know, an example for me for this was long ago, I used to, like before I really did actually the self-discovery work, I came on way too strong for people. (laughs) I came in to like meeting people for the first time. I came in loud. I was like overly like jittery and smiley and it made some people very uncomfortable. (laughs) And so much so that, oh my gosh, it's so funny. One of my best friends, Megan Reed. Her IG is Hey Megan Reed. She's going to be on the podcast on episode five, uh, or I'm sorry, either four or five. But anyways, I remember when we first met each other, we did not like each other. (laughs) We did not like each other until like further into (laughs) our relationship because it was like we each didn't make the best first impression because at that point, neither of us had really done self-discovery work. And so I came on too strong and too positive. And to me, she came off not positive enough. Like I used to have this thing where I was like, if somebody isn't like smiling a lot, like I am when I meet them, then I don't want to be their friend. (laughs) Um, And so it was so funny when we met that this happened. So Megan, I know she's listening to this too right now. And she can back that up that that's true. And now we're, we're best friends. Like we talk we took multiple times a week. We collab on things together in our business. Like 
she knows me better than so many, like we know each other better than so many people know us. It's because we did a lot of deep self-discovery work. Anyways, using that as an example, self-mastery really helps you create better relationships because, you know, it's not about, it's not about dimming who you are. It's just about understanding who you are, what your natural tendencies might be. And so for me, going to meet people for the first time, I was like, wow, you know, if I'm coming on too strong, I might be potentially pushing away possible friends and good relationships that I want to have by coming on too strong. So for me, it's not about not being who I am. It's just about like when I go to meet somebody for the first time, I just back it off just a little bit just a little bit. And I never not show who I am. It's not about that. It's not about hiding parts of you. It's just about relating to somebody and meeting them where they're at. And so it's been, it's been a huge learning uh, journey for me to kind of better understand where are people's energy at when I'm going to meet them. And just kind of matching that energy. I still always want my energy. I still want to help encourage people to grow to the energy that I'm at. I would always want to like lift people up. But sometimes the first meeting is not the place to do that. So this is just an example. And so those are really like five really important reasons why self-mastery is so incredible and how it can really change our lives. Hey, high achiever. I am so incredibly excited to share with you one of my signature methods, the pillar method that keeps my clients, students, and myself in alignment and performing at our highest potential. And it's completely free for a limited time. I created this mini course to give you a peek behind the scenes of what keeps me growing each week in both life and business. Head to programs.heytaylorthompson.com forward slash pillar to get access to this course, or you can find the link in the show notes. If you've been following me for a while, you know that brain, gut, and immune health are so incredibly important to me and help me performing at my best. I'm always on the lookout for wellness elixirs and products to add to my routine that is easy, travel-friendly, and free of any Franken ingredients. One of my favorite brands has been Four Sigmatic, especially their elixirs. Their elixirs are adaptogenic, caffeine-free, and include extra wellness-boosting ingredients to help you feel your best, whether you're trying to think, chill, defend, or perform. You can easily add this powder to your favorite coffee, tea, smoothie, or just in some hot water like I do, and adding it to my multiple beverage collection. And their packets are so easy to travel with. I can use them in the airport, hassle-free. You can use code HEYTAYLOR for 10% off your purchase at foursigmatic.com. All right, so let's move into really self-discovery. First off, it's important to really understand what makes you, you. And this is really our identity. So this is going to be a very simplistic explanation for what makes us, us. I could talk for an hour specifically on what makes us, us, right? What makes you, you. So today I'm going to just go into the identity piece. So your identity consists of the things that you know about yourself, what you inherently identify with, strengths, gifts, talents, personality test results, expressed quality and expressed traits. And it also includes influences. So we have a lot of things that influence our identity. Okay, these are things that have come from outside of you. Friends, family, society, culture, community, coworkers. It's likely that it has created at least a little disruption in the fabric of who you truly are. You may have taken on some of these influences and now you see them as part of your identity. It's undeniable that they are going to have an effect on who you are, who you've become, and who you will be. So these are things like the environment that we're in, trauma we've experienced, conditions or circumstances, any attachments we have to people or things, things like that. So influence there's definitely influence on our identity. What self-discovery really helps us with is identifying what's ours and what isn't. Who are we really and what have we taken on that is not ours to take on? Today, you know, we're really focusing more on the internal identity piece. So I won't really be touching on the influence piece today, 
But I think it's definitely worth mentioning to know and to kind of carry that through the exercises with you, knowing that you might have taken on some things that aren't yours. First off, understanding what makes you you is really your identity. Second, we can utilize the power of personality tests and archetypes. Okay, so if you are on the path of self-discovery and you have a yearning for greater self-awareness, personality tests and archetypes are an inevitable world to enter. (laughs) They just are. So now I know you don't need a test to tell you who you are. Ultimately, it takes an entire lifetime to figure out who we really are and all of the, you know, multifaceted pieces that make us us. And really no singular test or assessment can ever tell you everything about who you are. Okay? It just can't. <laughs> and most people, most people just never are going to know all there is to know about themselves, which is so wild to think. The power of these tests and assessments is that they can give you a lot of clear, pointed insight into your personality in a very short period of time. It's almost like a way to shortcut the self-discovery process. And, you know, I definitely like, is my Enneagram three showing? (laughs) I am all about those shortcuts, especially if that shortcut is in alignment and, you know, you're not shortcutting anything important, but it can save you time. Like I'm all about that. You're essentially just kind of like biohacking your success. So once you kind of enter this world, you may begin to feel a deep sense of being seen, heard, and understood by a system that claims to know aspects of who you are basically based off of your test answers or your birthday. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's so wild. This world is so cool. So I'm going to talk about some of the favorites for me. So I always recommend kind of leaning into assessments, personality tools and stuff that have already been developed and are widely used. So things like Enneagram, human design, horoscope, things like that. I'll go into some of my favorites for sure. Ultimately, you want to find one that you resonate with, and it might be all of them. It might be just one. Find one that you resonate with, learn about yourself, and and then see how you can apply that new knowledge to create a more personalized and aligned goal strategy. Apply that knowledge to become more deeply aligned. Apply that knowledge to then figure out what areas of yourself you want to develop more. Very, very powerful. So a few of my favorites, and I'm going to go through five of my favorites. Um, Number one is the Gallup Strengths Finder. This was developed by the Gallup Education, and it's It's more often used, I see, in like corporate and professional settings. It provides you with your top five strengths. So there are 34 different strengths that they have identified. They're all, the strengths all fall in domains like strategic thinking, relationship building, influencing, and executing. I really love this test because this is much more built on strengths and not many of the others touch on strengths necessarily. This is probably one of my favorite tools because it has also helped me with how I manage and optimize projects that I'm working on. And I will link everything in the show notes as well, links to all of these things. The one downfall about the Gallup Strengths Finder is that it costs money. I'm not 100% sure how much it costs, but I I know that it was worth it. (laughs) Um, And I'm actually due to take mine again very soon. Next is... Another favorite of mine is astrological charts. So basically this information gets calculated based on the relationship between like the date, time, and location of your birth and the cosmic objects, (laughs) let's say, that are positioned in the sky at that exact time and date and location. And the information that you can actually get from anything astrology related is very extensive. (laughs) You will get a lot of deep knowledge around this. I have been diving more into the astrology piece the last few months because I have seen, as I have been on this, you know, I'm in this like self-development, self-esteem, self-mastery, you know, phase of all of this. And as I'm leaning more into my shines, I am finding that I relate so much more to astrology than I did, you know, five years ago. So 
astrology is another really great place to learn about yourself. Next is the entrepreneurial archetype. And this is mostly for entrepreneurs, but essentially it's a system of personality typing for entrepreneurs to discover who they are as a business owner based on four core types, the creator, the coach, the teacher, and the entrepreneur. So each represents a different, like different qualities and core drivers that are rooted specifically in entrepreneurial strengths and weaknesses. So the combination of how these four core types sit in your chart really help you determine what kind of business model like is best to have, what offers you should have, what team hires you should have, and other big decisions. So the goal is really to align the essence of who you are in your work and in your business so you can be in more flow rather than force. This, and I could probably say this about all of these assessments, but this was huge for my business, huge, because I was operating for years and years and years, I was operating as the coach. I was operating as the coach first and the entrepreneur second, and I was kind of avoiding the teacher and the creator pieces. Well, it turns out <laughs> that I my top two were creator and teacher, and then entrepreneur, and my fourth one was coach. So I had built my business model around being the coach, and no, no wonder I wasn't fully aligned in my business because I thought that I needed the, a coaching type business model that's not where my strengths or desires lied. This was huge. This I ultimately changed my entire business model around this, my entire business model, and it has been so much better. And I am even hiring team or soon to hire team members that help fit that business model. And I am so excited because I'm going to outsource some of the things that I don't love doing and just aren't in my strengths. So I love the entrepreneurial archetype. That's that one is a ton of fun. Next is the Enneagram. Okay, this is my favorite, hands down. I talk a lot about it with my clients, um, but it's a system of personality typing that describes nine personality types, and it maps each of these types on a nine-pointed diagram, which is called the Enneagram. And this ultimately helps illustrate how the different types or the different numbers relate to one another. So each Enneagram type is defined by a particular core belief about how the world works, driving motivations and fears, and fundamentally shapes how a person has perspective and worldview. For example, I'm an Enneagram 3 wing 4, and knowing that my core motivation is to be successful and my core fear is failure helps me with my decisions because I'm regularly asking myself if I'm pursuing something because I want to, or is it because someone else wants me to, or is it because I'm trying to fulfill someone else's version of success because I desire success? That's a core motivation of an Enneagram 3. This has helped a ton, a ton, a ton. So highly recommend the Enneagram. Honestly, if you are listening to this and you're just wanting to get started, I think the Enneagram is one of the most simple ones to understand. It even helps to know other people's Enneagram type because then I can just best, I can better relate to them. I know I ask every single one of my clients and my students what Enneagram they are, what their human design is. If they, I ask them some of these questions if they have the answers to them because, um, because it also helps me create a better strategy for them. So... All right, the fifth one that I really love, fifth and last one that I'll talk about today that I really love is human design. Okay, this this one is much more complex. This is maybe as complex as astrology is. It's basically a system that explains how you were built, how your energy works, how you best respond to the world. It's kind of like a combination between astrology and Myers-Briggs. I know I didn't put Myers-Briggs on this list. I think that's a great one. I haven't found as much use for it in kind of the high performance business process. But anyways, human design is kind of like astrology and Myers-Briggs had a baby. <laughs> so an example of this is for me, I'm a manifesting generator with a three, five profile. And ultimately I spent years trying to play down how multi-passionate I was. Manifesting generators thrive on having multiple irons in the fire. And I was living in a world that told me 
not to do that. So I wouldn't, and I didn't feel fulfilled. It turns out, after discovering human design, that that's actually how I work best. And so when anybody is trying to tell me to do less (laughs) or to take on less projects, then I usually just tune them out. But also knowing that about myself and that's how I work best, I am very in tune also with knowing like when is, if too much is too much, you know? Also, so like my profile, so like the three in my profile, it's important for me to learn from failures. So this is something I have been a huge like learning nerd. I love, love to learn. I love to read books. I love to listen to podcasts. I love to take courses. If I could have, if I could make a full-time living learning, like literally I would sit down like 60 hours a week and just learn all day long. If I could do that, I like would be the happiest person on the planet. (laughs) However, the three in my profile means that I learn best from failures, like my own failures. Like I learn best from making mistakes. I learn best from my own experiences. So this is something that if I am wanting to learn more, then usually I just need to do more and not necessarily adding more things to my list. I mean, like I need to be in the doing and reflect on and learn from what I am doing versus learning from other people. The wisdom that I'm going to create within myself is going to come from my own experience and not from learning information that somebody else is teaching me, essentially. That's just kind of some examples of things that I have learned through the human design. I think it's been so, so powerful. Human design also works really, really well with structuring your business model and your offering suite. So those are kind of the five that I love to start out with. Strength, Gallup, Strengths Finder, Astrology, Entrepreneurial Archetype, Enneagram, and Human Design. After you go through and actually take some of these tests and assessments, then it's best to reflect on and question your results. So once you have your results, you realize that you have a lot of information about who you are. Okay, so as someone who has received so much information from personality tests, um, and really actually not even outside of information, I've received so much uh, like validation, permission, acceptance of myself, alignment. You know, I've also allowed myself to relate to my results as an infinitely expanding awareness rather than a small box. Sometimes people will take these tests and they feel like they're put into a box. I really view it as, like I said, infinitely expanding awareness, which I think is so powerful. So tests and models are some of the most valuable guides that we can get right? You can use these to see your natural strengths and weaknesses, what environments you flourish in. You know, with your business, you can use them, like I mentioned, to hire hire team members, like how to relate to team members, what team members you should hire out for. And it can feel empowering to see characteristics pop up, which you may have felt shame or sensitivity around. And instead, you really own them because it's giving you permission to just come back to yourself. Once you have this information, you want to reflect on that information and then question the results. Don't just take all of it on as an identity, right? Because there are some things that you might find out that are are not true for you, and that's fine. Striking the balance between exploring, is this true for me? And then questioning, is this true for me? It's really powerful. So these results are really are going to show you your potential natural default, okay? And you really get to choose your growth from there. Step number four, after you've reflected and you've questioned some of the information, you can expect a growth and evolution. So understand that these results may seem fixed, but your evolution is always fluid, So as you continue to grow and move through the layers, you'll see more of your true self come through, complete with so many facets that feel beautiful, rich, and diverse. Hey, this can be revealing, can be daunting and exciting, like you're a brand new person. You might even look back at yourself and not even recognize who you were, 
wondering who that person was. It's happened to me so many times. I know I mentioned this in episode one. I say old Taylor, new Taylor, and like old Taylor is who I have evolved and grown from. It's happened to me so many times throughout my journey. Like sometimes it's left me confused and completely questioning my whole identity. (laughs) That is okay. (laughs) Um, But spoiler alert, you are still the same person. Okay. This is just a part of growth and evolution. If you are a beginner, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to take a few of these tests to start that self-discovery process. If you're familiar, but you want to learn more, go back to any notes that you've taken or results that you've gotten and really reflect on them. Ask yourself what the next level of you looks like and what shifts need to be made. And if you are a self-discovery pro and you want something a little more advanced, screenshot this episode and tag me in your stories with your biggest takeaway and send me a DM on Instagram. In turn, I will send you my super not so secret self-discovery spreadsheet that helps you assess and analyze your data to see how everything works together. This has been a brainchild of mine. I love to get nerdy in spreadsheets. Like I mentioned in the trailer, I'm a freak in the spreadsheets and I'm obsessed with self-discovery and self-mastery and learning more about myself, developing myself, mastering myself. And so I wanted to put all of this information into one spreadsheet and see how does it work best? Like how do these all work together? So if you want that, it is free for you. Just be sure to screenshot this episode, tag me in your stories with your biggest takeaway and send me a DM. So once I have both of those, I will send that spreadsheet over to you. I hope that you loved this episode. This is just one of many episodes that we're going to have on self-mastery and there's other ways to get deeper into self-discovery. And this is just one of the quickest ways to do so. The other ways, you know, include like actually asking some people that are close to you, asking them questions about yourself. Like, Hey, like, what do you think some of my strengths are? What are some words that you think about when you think of me and just getting curious, essentially just getting curious and helping people come up with some of that for you. And also just self-reflection, just general self-reflection through journaling and meditation, or just sitting and just asking, you know, what, what am I good at? What could I develop more? You know, what am I motivated by? Things like that. Just getting curious. So I am so excited for you to take this information and run with it and really get to the next level of your self-mastery journey. Thank you for joining us this week. Before you go, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you can receive new episodes right when they're released. And if you're enjoying this podcast, I'd love for you to leave us a review in Apple Podcasts. Reviews are one of the major ways that Apple ranks their podcasts. So even though it only takes a few seconds, it really does make a huge difference. Lastly, you can head to my Instagram post today and comment your biggest takeaway from this episode so we can keep the conversation going. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you next time.